the infamous recruit bot himself, the recruit bot master. No, I'm just getting in here with Jeremy Schiff. Jeremy, we've we've had a couple of conversations. We've talked offline. We've talked here, this event. And you and I were kind of game planning how we're going to handle this conversation. But let's get one thing out of the way real quick. Tell on who you are and what you guys do. Yeah. Let's get that uh, shit out. First of all, <laughs> thanks for having me. So I am a hardcore AI guy who's just been involved in recruiting for the last seven years. My last company, I sold it to OpenTable where I was running machine learning and data science. And I also have a PhD from Berkeley. And so at OpenTable, I was getting really, I was having a lot of challenges with making sure that the right types of machine learning and data engineers were on our team. So I ended up spending a lot of my time at OpenTable, scaling up and spending a lot of time with my recruiting organization learning about that. So was it a people challenge versus the technical skill? Like you, you said you didn't, you're having a challenge with the people. We was were having- the skills with the people? Was it the lack of skills that those people have or the actual people themselves? Just curious. It was actually about the pipeline. So I couldn't get the people with the skills that we needed to have the conversation. So you saw a problem while you were at OpenTable and- That's exactly right. So and that you said, I think there's a better way to do this. That's exactly right. I just saw how manual it was, how complicated, seemingly overly complicated it was, and how ineffective it was, and was just like, there's got to be a better way to get really great, great people to engage with you. And because I like, if I can get a conversation going with a candidate, I can usually turn that into something great. Right. But if I'm not having a conversation with a candidate, there's sort of nothing that I can do. Yeah, no pipeline. Exactly. So fundamentally, I started RecruitBot for a problem that I was dealing with firsthand, which was that I needed a way to get conversations going with hard to fill roles or just like large numbers of very high quality people. Did you start this while you were still at OpenTable? I did hard, not. You had a hard stop. And you said yeah, so I actually... Focus. So because we sold the company to OpenTable, as you might imagine, it was my actually my third startup, or this one's my third startup, and so I was pretty tired. So I took a year off to travel the world. Good. And then how important really was that year of self care? It's. Were you working during that time? Did no, I literally full? did nothing. I mean, I I did no work. I didn't. I didn't have like I literally. I didn't check email for a year. So I really literally cleared, just. You cleared the mainframe. Cleared the mainframe. It was great. What, and what was your favorite place that you visited? They were all just so different. Singapore was like surprisingly way more fun than I thought I was going to be. People were like, go for a day. I went for 10 days. A friend of mine had lived there for 10 years. And I love like doing what the locals do. Yeah, live and like it, the locals. Yeah, it was amazing. I get that from Bourdain. Live like the locals. It was unreal. And yeah, I mean, when you're like, I go really hard. I mean, we were just talking about it like at dinner the other day that like I'm I'm working 12, 14 hour days. So when you're working, you're working. You're I'm, chilling, I'm you're working chilling. real hard. But I, I love that approach as an entrepreneur, yeah. too, and everyone's going to find their own yin and yang and like kind of what works for you. Yep. And like, it's not, I hate work life balance. I hate that expression. For me, it's the word is harmony. Because as you just mentioned before, there's times like me when it's, you know, 12, 15 hour yeah. days, and then I want to shut down, throw my phone away, leave me alone. I want to be with the kids. I want to be with my friends and, and focus on that and finding that balance. Absolutely. Let's get let's get back to it. The first iteration of, of RecruitBot what yep. was, and listen, this is your third startup. You're analytical and technical by mindset and by trade. Yep. So you know, you have the understanding of the formula of test and learn and optimization. Very but much what, so. But what was one of those hypotheses is that you proved yourself wrong on early on? Yeah. So, I mean, the entire premise of the company was wrong when we started which was we were actually focused on prioritizing inbound when we started. And we, like a lot of recruiters were like, this is something that we want. And then we tried to go and sell it to them. And they're like, I can actually just go hire some like really cheap people to review resumes all day. I right. don't actually need AI to go and help with that. Um, That's a learning you need though. That's the input. For you. Yeah, it was actually like life changing. So we went to a, we, I was at HR, I think it was HR Tech five years ago and one of the job board, the SVPs of one of the job board companies reached out to me and was just like, hey, can I get 30 minutes of your time? And I, we, I talked a little bit about the business and he was like, you know what's going to be a lot more useful than go and prioritizing 2,000 people of people who've applied? Help me prioritize hundreds of millions of people that exist on the internet. Light bulb moment. And all of a sudden I was like, Light I'm working moment. on the wrong problem. Wow. And, I wanna, I wanna, and I wanna, literally three months later, we had raised our first round of funding and we're like off the races. Let's, let, let, let's take a, a, a pause in that for a second. Understanding the problem that you're trying to solve 
I mean, that's 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 the root of it. Some of the other entrepreneurs, they're dealing with all the other bullshit around it. They're not focusing on the problem. They're, sure. just, they're falling into the glam side of it, but because it's your third rodeo, you've been around the block and you understand that. Let's get into AI for a little bit. Sure, and love we've been it. we talking about this for a little bit. If you open your ears at this conference or any other HR tech conference, you, you can't get AI, ML, AML, and ML, whatever the hell you hear out of your ears. Sure. I have found as a, I'm, I know enough to be dangerous as a recruiter. I know enough to be dangerous as a podcaster when it comes to AI. But how could, let's look at it from two approaches. As a company who's hiring and you're being approached by vendors here or trying to pitch your AI, sure. what is the right question to ask to, to know if it's the right product, the right AI, do they know what the fuck they're doing? So the companies that are generally more sophisticated with AI don't actually talk about that they have AI as much as they talk about very concrete problems that they can now solve with the AI. So they don't, people don't need to know that the sausage is made. They're assuming that this company knows what That's right. the sausage is. So, I mean, I've literally had customers come up to me and be like, we need to add a, we need, we need sourcing with AI. And I'm like, what does that mean? Right? Like, and it's, and, and that, that is ultimately like, they're looking for some like check at the box. Like, I don't know, like sprinkle the AI fairy dust. AI and so, yeah, exactly. And so the good vendors will actually do it the other way around. They'll push back and they'll be like, so what are your biggest problems? And like, again, if you've been spending 20 years building AI and machine learning products that I do, I will say, these sorts of problems I can just solve with a simple you may, you may set of stuff. It might be a simple sourcing. Like, and there's a ton of stuff like your that. Your stack isn't like you just don't need it. The pipeline, you maybe have a superfluous like item in there. That's exactly right. And some right. of it can be really impactful. So, like a great example on the other side is we just launched some features now. So I, I guess we RecruitBot is like a passive outreach tool, right? So our job is to find and email candidates that aren't necessarily looking for a job and get those conversations going. Exactly that problem I was talking about from OpenTable. And so we've just launched some new generative AI where we can take a job description and automatically suggest the search that you should run to go and work out what candidates to target and can automatically start suggest description. Here is a sample set of messages that you want to email and follow up with the candidate to get them to talk to you. So notice that's not like AI. That's like very concrete problems where like what I hear all the time from recruiters, they're like, we're not marketers. I want to be on the phone with candidates talking to them. I don't know what the ideal message is to get that conversation going. Like there are 10% of sourcers who are like, yep, that's my bread and butter. But most of them What's are just not? like, help me. But you, but you said something that's interesting I want to double back on. What if the job description is inaccurate? So again, we're going to suggest based on that information, right? So if you have a really poor quality job description, it's the first pass might be bad. Job. That's right. So, but our AI will also make it in, so you can like you can go and describe broadly. You can be like, "Hey, AI, can you add to the second email more information about this investor and some of the investments that they've made to help convert it?" And it will go and sort of fill in the information that you that's need. Fast, that's fascinating right now. What is some of the? I mean, is there pushback from clients? So, or is it too? Is it ever too much for them? Or too my, overwhelming? My experience has been, so like there's a lot of like generalized fear about AI and like, but I feel like it's shifted pretty quickly. So like when the ChatGPT stuff especially was coming out, everyone was like hearing these insane things like in six months or in a year, recruiters won't have jobs, sourcers won't have jobs. We're all gonna AI be out of business. Everyone's out of business. No one does recruiters anything. Recruiters are all more. out of business AI here, does folks. everything, right? And so, but people have rapidly come around to realizing AI is going to dramatically change the way that people do their job. And the people who adopt it are going to make a lot more money because they can be way more efficient like, with their time. Don't sleep on this. But the ones that don't adopt it are going to get crushed. So the, the metaphor I like to use is ancient recruiting, you used to have like a paper Rolodex of all of the people you would talk to, right? And then the internet came around and people were like, for 20 years I've been making a great living using this paper Rolodex to go and hire people. The internet came around and like you five years later, anyone using a Rolodex wasn't going to be able to do business. There's a, there's an even more intense revolution that's going to happen over the next three years Here with AI. People. And so if like you need to start training your teams on AI now so that as it's evolving, your team knows how to go and engage with it because you're not going to want to be in a year, year and a half like, oh, I like now is when we want to go and ad adopt AI because you're still going to have to train people on 
doing their job differently. Well, that's that's a key differentiator. We need to get out of the mindset of, listen, let's be honest about it. There are going to be, when people throw around, you know, AI is going to take your job. No, the person knows how to use AI is going to take your that's job. That's exactly right. Right. And so going into a company and saying to recruiters and other folks, hey, we're not here to teach you about what's going to take your job. We're teaching you how to use this so you can be better at your job, so you can focus on the people part of recruiting. Absolutely. On the relationships. Take away all these operational inefficiencies that you can make more efficient, quicker, better, smarter, faster with AI so you could focus on, as a recruiter, the one part that AI is not going to get, and I'm curious if you're going to push back on this, is understanding a candidate's motivation. Now, I may say, Jeremy, you may want to be leaving your company. You may be a passive candidate, but when I put more, what's going to make you move? Is it sentiment? Is it money? Do you have a, a nagging husband or wife? Do you have an ailing relative that you need to care for? You need to, I'm very happy where I am, but shit, I got to make 30000 more to put my parents into a nursing home. Like, yep. That is not going to come from AI, or is it? So I, I, so. Like how the, deep and trolly do we get? I think that sort of stuff is basically impossible for a very specific reason. Anyone who thinks that, like, just thinking about it purely from a data perspective, ironically, people all the time have asked, hey, RecruitBot, because they ask us all the time. Do they say, can, I can, am RecruitBot? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, we call him Arby, but like Arby, like, I like R and the B, it's cute. Like He's adorable. Oh, okay. Arby's is good too. Arby sauce is one of the best um, condiments. Next, I, I side note, I love Chick Fil A and I love Chick Fil A sauce. The Arby Horsey sauce. A couple times a year, I have it. And sorry, Chick Fil A sauce. That Arby sauce. But I digress. Let's get back to your Arby. Sorry. So our Arby. So people ask him all ask all the time. Can you go and tell me a culture fit based on the resume? And the answer, like, the answer is like, no, that's insane. You actually have to talk to the person. You actually probably have to back channel and do references about other people. There's not, like, magical data no. in there that, can, that people can go and infer. I mean, you're not going to go in there and scrape their Facebook to see, like, I mean, to, you, you can do a full social media swap and get some kind of sentiments about what's going on in their life. But, is, but that's not going to tell you how they're going to go and operate in a job, right? Like, no, that but it may, tell but it them, may like, tell you what their motivation is as far as when they might be sure. looking to move. And, and if so, you look at a sentiment analysis... Absolutely. So I do think that there's a world many years from now where AI is going to go and summarize that information and be like, here are factors you might want to poke at more when you're doing the interview. But this notion that it's going to all happen automatically and you're not going to have some sort of interaction with the candidate to go and actually make decisions is insane. No, like you, you like you, you, you need you need a conversation going between the candidate and the recruiter to understand the motivations, what that like, all the stuff mm. that isn't in the resume. Like, there's a ton of stuff, right? Like, of how course. many? If there wasn't, why? Like, why you would interviews it. exist? You, you would just you it. would just look at a resume and you would make hire and fire decisions just based on the resume, based which on is a insane. Pure historical document of what someone has done, not what their aptitude, attitude, and desires to exactly. do. Which me, which requires a conversation. Of, of course, of course, it does. I want to get into the entrepreneurial journey a little bit because you, three times entrepreneur. Yep. What is a, a common mistake that could be avoided if you could share some knowledge with some newer founders out there? And it's a bit of a general statement. Let's talk about it from a, from a funding perspective. What's a common mistake they could avoid? Maybe it's a trap. Maybe it's a, you're getting lured in. You know, I was just talking to Mike, Mike before over there from Aaron, and he said, the goal, the mission should not be to get funding. It's oh, for only, sure. It should only be if you need it to make you better, faster, stronger that you can't do yourself. Why would you give equity away? Yeah, I mean, again, it's always about like, what can I go and do this money with this money that I couldn't do normally? So like more, so broad, there's sort of like two different aspects of the question. So the first one is like, as an entrepreneur, the number one thing that's really tricky is you need to have this really weird balance where you need to have a vision and you need to know what your company is doing and you need to be very opinionated about that. But you also need to be very empathetic and listen to the customer and change what you're doing based on what the customer is asking. And those things are almost seem contradictory, right? Where like, you're like, I'm going to be like Steve Jobs and I'm going to blindly just tell people what they want. There's one person on the planet who's been able to do that in the last God knows how long, Steve Jobs. And then there's the other side where if you're too empathetic, you're bouncing around building every little feature that everyone wants focused. and you're not building anything. And so the number one thing that I have there is like working out when to, when to, how to synthesize the information you're getting, mm -hmm. sort of to the previous question. And then on the funding side, it's about, it's, a, it's exactly that. It's about you need to raise enough funding to sort of take yourself to the next level 
And especially in this market now, it's sort of course corrected. It was it's le it was yeah, much it was easier to do it before. It was a recalibration. Yeah, you could yeah. just raise way more money that really made sense. And a lot of companies now are getting caught where their valuations don't make sense and they're having a really hard time raising their next round. They have to do a lot of downsizing, all of those sorts of things. So a lot of it is just being disciplined enough to raise a good amount of money to get yourself to the next milestone but not sort advice. of like just trying to maximize your valuation at all costs because if you do it wrong, it can really bite you. That's, that's fascinating. Let's give a little, little bit of alpha as much as you can. What, what, what are you guys working on? What's next for Kubot? So yeah, I mean, honestly, the thing that we're most focused on right now is this is this generative AI piece. We literally, the, the feature and I was for, describing for about. For anyone out there, what's, what does generative AI mean? Let's just give, let's explain oh, it to sure. my mom. So, so, Mom, Jeremy's going to explain what generative AI is. So there are two types of AI, and so people often are used to hearing like machine learning. That's a specific type of AI called discriminative AI, and the other half of AI is generative AI. So when you're on Facebook or TikTok or Amazon and it's recommending things based on other things that you've liked before, that's discriminative AI. What it's trying to do is discriminate or work out which things are in a category based or not in a category based on your past activities. Yes. So it's literally, the discrimination is, is this relevant to the user or is this not relevant so to the user? if and or yes or no, very black and white. Yeah, so it's, it's generally encoded as a, what is the probability that this is good or bad? As opposed to like, this is good or this is bad. Gotcha. So like when we're, when we're taking 6,000 marketing leaders and we're saying these are the 50 that are most promising for you to talk to, that's using discriminative AI. That's using what people typically call folks. machine learning. That is. Then there's generative AI, which is generally about taking some text input and generating something new. That can be text, that can be audio, that can video. be video. And so the generative AI is, as in the title, it's generating something based on what you've asked. So the most common one, which is what people are starting to see with ChatGPT and things like, Claude and Gemini and all of these sorts of companies are you can put in a prompt and have it sort of give you an answer. So you can say like, I don't know, tell me the top 10 SaaS companies that I should be watching. Are you using and it'll go Google you. though? Yeah, so, I mean, very much so. It's sort of like a smarter, like, it's like a Google that can synthesize a lot of different types of right. information. And so, but that's much more of like an interactive chat interface. But we're now finding, we're starting to see cost, like it, it'll become sort of more common, but it takes a lot of companies that have like very deep sort of AI experience like ours to get sort of the first version that like isn't something really basic. So if you see a lot of generative AI companies right now, a lot of them, it feels like they just took ChatGPT Chat -GPT and like plugged it into their, to their yeah, system. Yeah, it's like it was like a check the box. That's right. And th that's what it is. And, but like with our system, it's much more focused on a specific problem, right? Give me a job description. Let me see. Generate a search okay, it's and generate it, and generate a drip campaign. And I'm generating those things based on the input that is the job description. Well, that makes sense to me. I hope everyone out there is listening up because I think Jeremy breaks it down better than anyone I've had on this show before. Because he's talking to you from a business perspective. He's talking to you from the tech perspective. Let's bring it home here. What is a business owner is keeping you up at night? What is a business owner is keeping me up at night? Honestly, I'm just really optimistic right now. 2023 was a very tricky year. Say the least. We did a lot of like pivoting and changing the product and really honing in on stuff. It's actually benefited us in the long run because we had to be like very focused. Honestly, with 2024, we're seeing a lot of optimism, especially in the recruiting space. People are getting back to hiring, all of that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it's happening. There is still a little bit of like, a little bit of caution. And so for me, it's just a little bit of that is around when it's going to go from the caution to like, okay, we're really like heads down growing again. And when that and when that's going to be is sort of an interesting question. And honestly, I think it'll be pretty soon. The, the, the information we're seeing from all of the customers we're talking to is it's getting pretty imminent of like, we've already transitioned from like huge amounts of layoffs to like things are a little it's a stagnant. Recalibration. And that, yeah, the recalibration is done. Yeah. I think the, like the plateau, flatten the flatten out has happened and it's starting to build. And the question is like, 
how fast is that build going to accelerate? And I'm talk. just really excited about this it. This is a real talk. I'm excited too. Jeremy, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today. It's been great to, to hang and, and get to know you and break bread. And I think that's what these conferences are, are all about. It's relationship driven. Where could folks find you? Where could they learn more about RecruitBot? So yeah, just visit RecruitBot.com. And we're always happy to talk more about any, if you have any questions about AI and machine learning in general, ways to improve your recruiting stack. We're happy to go and talk. And again, it could be much broader than like, I'm looking to buy a solution today. We have a lot of conversations where we're just sort of educating the market about how AI is really disrupting things. And we know that that'll eventually end up somewhere great for us and for our partners. So there we go. Just come on by. Jeremy Schiff, RecruitBot. That's how we do it, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.